I want to thank Alan and everybody else who's on the call. It's a pleasure to speak with you tonight. I have been uh, involved with astronomy since third grade, and hopefully it's, it's advanced a little since then. Chose to major in physics in college and have stayed uh, close to the hobby of astronomy ever since. I have had the pleasure of leading some star parties on top of Bental Mountain, which was overlooking Syria in the Golan Heights and also in leading a star party in the Negev Desert for some day school students from Kelman Brown Academy near Philadelphia here. I have schlepped my wife Selma to Outback Australia to view the Southern Milky Way, and that was just sublime. I said, you're gonna either go to South Africa, South America, or Australia. We picked Australia, and uh, that's a long, long schlep from LA. It was really uh, four full length movies. I first delivered this presentation to uh, my Masonic Lodge in downtown Philly about three years ago. But for FJMC, I've upgraded it, added a whole bunch of new information, and injected a little more of a Jewish flavor because of the audience that uh, we're, we're delivering it to. I'm going to try at this point to uh, share the screen. Let me know if you can see the presentation. I better move this thing out of the way. Does that look okay? You see it? All right, that's good. Going to talk about a, a long time span, Genesis to gravitational waves, and uh, it really goes the entire length of the, the universe. So it's a, a long time ago and very far away, like the start of Star Wars. Let me see, it should be able to go forward. There we go. All early cultures watch the sky. Uh, they created myths to explain what they saw. And in particular, we had some fun down in Australia, went to the center of the country, the Aborigines there have a, uh, a nice museum where we saw a presentation on dream time. They, uh, dream time is their legend of creation. And they start out with the earth being a flat surface in darkness. And then supernatural ancestor beings broke through the crust of the earth from below with tumultuous force. This is, this is what they believe. Uh, and the area that they were living, of course, uh, the Australian desert, flat surface sounds good. About 6,000 years ago, the Sumerians created mathematics, which was heavily based on the number 60. They measured years by 12, 12 new moons, and they also added leap months every so often. The Babylonians kind of inherited that. They divided the sky into 12 constellations of the zodiac. And in fact, they created astrology, even prepared horoscopes, which are similar to what we can read and, and see in the newspapers now. They assigned 360 degrees to the measure of circles, which is six times 60, that, that figure 60 pops up a lot. And they define minutes and seconds using a base number of 60 also. And we still use that in uh, our timekeeping devices and uh, measuring of, of where you are on the Earth's surface, for instance, minutes and seconds are definitely applicable. The Torah came along, and the first couple of sentences from Bereshit actually focused on creation of light. Verse 2 starts the beginning of a darkened time period when matter was unformed and void. And verse 3 ends with the first appearance of light. With this group, we can read it in Hebrew, and I did this also for the Masons. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim v'et ha-aretz. So God created the heaven and the earth. V'ha-aretz, the earth, haita tohu vavohu. These particular words only appear once in the Torah, and they only appear in this context. And it's probably understandable because... At this time, there was no Aretz, there was no earth. It was a fluid, perhaps. It was, it was sloshy or plastic. Choshech, the Choshech, and it was darkness. Al Pene Tahom. Now, the translation is given as upon the face of the deep. I have, I think, a better translation for Tahom, which could be turbulence. The Ruach Elohim, Rachefet Al Pene Amaim. Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water. There was no water. I think a flow might be a better description. Here's what I'm trying to say. The Big Bang cosmology 
estimates about 380,000 years when the time of darkness reigned. And this was energy spewing forth from the, the point source, which was where the universe got its energy coming out of. And it was a turbulent flow. No matter could exist because the temperatures were extremely hot, billions of degrees Kelvin. So I think with just making that, that little change of turbulent flow in verse two, we can really, from a scientific standpoint, pick up these three verses and have no problem with them. Verse three, Vayomer Elohim Yehior, Vayior. God said, let there be light. There was light. And that's how it happened. It, it really doesn't differ very much from, from uh, Big Bang cosmology that way. Astronomy continued to develop. And if we go back, let's say 3,500 to 1,800 years ago, there were no telescopes, certainly. Greek mythology came along and they said the earth is flat and everybody could certainly see it looked flat. The Bible concurred. It said the earth is the center of the universe. It doesn't move. The, the issues that it's raising are primarily in Psalms, where they say now is the earth firmly established, will not be moved. And if you interpret that literally, then you're going to have trouble trying to allow new information to come in. But if it's metaphoric, then that's fine. It's poetry. Pythagoras and Aristotle came along and they said, you know what? We took a look at the moon when it was in eclipse or getting close to eclipse. And you can see the shadow of the earth on the moon. And look, it has an arc connected with it. The only thing we know of that could cause an arc would be a sphere. The earth, therefore, must be spherical. So they started to improve on, on what their knowledge was over prior Greek mythology. Ptolemy, a little bit later, came on and said planets move in epicycles. Now, this is kind of complex, but what he's referring to is that the planets, let's say Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, they will start out in the evening sky going from west toward the east over the course of several months. Then all of a sudden, they start moving east to west. And a couple months later, they go back to, to west to east. So this looping, Ptolemy called an epicycle. And that was his theory of how the planets moved, still maintaining that the Earth was the center of, of everything. From about 1800 years ago to 600 years ago, they still had no telescopes. European science had atrophied during the Dark Ages. There was nothing going on. And Islam in the Arabic countries was able to preserve knowledge of astronomy. In fact, every bright star that you can see in the sky has an Arabic name connected with it. So you've got Aldebaran, Algal, Altair, Albirio, Deneb, Rigel. These are all Arabic names. I think there's one that's a Hebrew name, Kohav. That's a, a star in the Little Dipper. Uh, but until the Renaissance, the first telescope then became available and mathematics started to flower. So in 1543, Copernicus came along and he made some really accurate measurements of where the planets were, where the stars were. And he said, you know what? I believe that the sun is the center of the solar system, not the earth. And there's a little picture of him on the side with, with the sun in the middle and the earth going around it. Is everything okay? Okay. Um, but he didn't publish until he actually passed away. He, he uh, decided it was not going to be a safe thing for him to do. 1609, Galileo, putting the first telescope, he put some lenses on it on a tube and was able to create a telescope. He, he trained it on Jupiter. And then for several nights in a row, he noticed that the, the Jupiter's moons were moving around. Um, and he, he rightfully said, you know what? Those moons don't go around Earth. They have nothing to do with Earth. They're actually connected with Jupiter. It can't be that Earth is the center of everything. He decided to present his information to the church. Uh, and he got into trouble for doing that. And they placed him under house arrest for the rest of his life. Uh, the church relented afterwards. Later in the 1600s, uh, Newton came along man with creative genius. He was 
uh, invented the calculus and uh, one of his laws, force equals mass times acceleration. As a physics major, you had to learn that, that law forward and backward and, and with all kinds of derivatives and calculus applied to it. But his law stayed, stayed law for a good 300 years and his interpretations, somebody's feedback, okay. Um, his law was enforced and actually it's still valid for most of the solar system. When NASA launches a probe going toward Pluto, that's a very low gravitational area and Newton's law will absolutely get them there and there's no, no problem. The only issues arise when you, you aim toward the sun instead and actually Mercury is the only planet that has some issues connected with uh, Newton's law. And uh, that's, that gave an opening for Einstein who we're gonna come, up, come upon next. The 20th century was absolutely phen phenomenal in terms of, of what was accomplished. And one of our Lanzmann, Einstein, in 1905 published four papers which were incredible one of which gained him a Nobel Prize, where he proved that light was quantized into photon particles. It had always been accepted that light was a wave and you can explain how it moved as a wave. But he said, yeah, there, that's true in certain circumstances, but uh, when a photon of light, and he defined what that was, hits a certain charged plate, uh, electrically charged plate, you could actually bounce the, the photons off of that plate and you could see exactly what's happening and, and he got uh, the Nobel Prize on that. He also had the, the tremendous capability of fixing the speed of light. He said that's constant no matter what. 186,000 miles per second, nothing can go faster than that in a vacuum. And we have been trying for at least a good hundred years to, to prove him wrong on that but uh, it does seem to hold up in all kinds of trials and tests. His equation E equals MC squared, everybody knows. And it says that if you take a little bit of mass, a little bit of matter, multiply it by the square of the speed of light, suddenly you get a huge amount of energy coming out. And the uh, atomic bomb was one of the, the uh, results of that, but there's a, a tremendous amount of use that's, that's really made of that since. 1915, he developed the general theory of relativity. The prior one was the special theory. Special theory said what's true where you don't have accelerations. General theory says we're gonna work with accelerations. Accelerations, the same thing as a gravity. And uh, by the way, gravity is gonna bend light and Newton's law is gonna fail near very strong gravitational fields. He was not immediately accepted on this but in 1921, they, they sent uh, eclipse expeditions. There was a solar eclipse, proved what he said was right. He became an instant uh, celebrity. His theory led to discovery of black holes and the prediction of wormholes. Now, a wormhole, I'm not sure if you're familiar. This is if you wanna get from here to a very distant part of the universe, instead of getting in a rocket ship and going linearly to that uh, destination, if somehow you could bend space around, puncture it, and go through hyperspace, you can come out at the other end and you'll be there at a certain time and a certain place without having made the trip itself. Uh, we haven't really been able to, to put wormholes to effective use yet, but I think that's probably gonna be 21st century physics. Uh, there's a story I wanna share with you. When I was about seven years old, my, uh, my dad said to my mother and I, we're gonna take a trip. I've got a business trip up to Princeton. Uh, we, we got in the car and drove. He had to meet his boss for a meeting. We drove from Northeast Philly up to Princeton and, and uh, sat in the car waiting for him to come out. I think it took two, almost three hours and I was going crazy as a seven-year-old. Um, but he came out and he was beaming, absolutely beaming. Uh, he said, you'll never guess what happened. We shook hands with Einstein. Apparently Einstein was at this meeting that uh, my dad and the boss were at. 
They decided after the meeting was done to go walk over and introduce themselves. They did that, shook hands and, and talked for a little while. And he came back to the car. It was like Moses coming down from the mountains with tablets. He was, I just talked to Einstein. <laughs> it was really, really a fascinating thing. I didn't know at that age what exactly was a special uh, thing that he had done, but it really made a difference for him. Around 1929, Hubble discovered that the universe was not static, but expands as time pass, passes. Now, Einstein hadn't really figured that the, the universe was expanding. He made it, he created his equation so that it would take care of a static universe. He called it his greatest blunder, but actually he didn't have the information about expanding universes. And once he got it, that was a whole different uh, situation. 1995, Jeff Marcy in San Francisco detected the first planets that were circling other stars. We call them exoplanets. So this is how the 20th century ended, but there were a couple of loose ends with what the ma major theory, the Big Bang theory was, and those loose ends still exist today. Dark energy and dark matter. Big Bang Theory predicted a microwave flash. It was actually a visible light flash, I guess, but over the course of 14 billion years or so, uh, it stretched it out into the micro microwave region. And uh, it was actually detected in 1964. There were two Bell Telephone uh, researchers who were in, uh, in New Jersey. And they, they found this signal and they said, uh, what is this? That maybe we better send it down to Princeton and ask them. And they actually got the Nobel Prize for discovering this microwave flash. Kobe satellite in 1989 imaged the flash and it's that picture on the bottom left. If you notice, it's composed of dark blue, which are the colder regions. Uh, green is sort of an average area and yellow and, and red are the extra, extra hot air. Hey, some, please mute, yeah. <laughs> and the actual temperature difference between the blue and the red is not very much. It, it's a hundredth of a degree or something, but this map is the first map that could be created when light was able to, to move across the universe. This is the, and there was light moment. This is what was talked about in verse 3 of, of uh, the Torah. Uh, nothing really that we can do can go farther back uh, to see anything because light couldn't travel any, any great distance before that time. Dark matter holds gravity galaxies together and dark energy causes an expansion of the universe. It was noted earlier in the century, last uh, in the 20th century, that galaxies were spinning a little too fast for the actual matter that they contain to hold them together. It's like somebody took a pizza pie, spun it up, and the cheese started to fly out. They said there has to be something better that's holding it together. There's got to be more gravity. So they inferred that there had to be dark matter. And then they said, well, look, the ex if you see that center picture where it says Big Bang in it down the bottom, uh, the universe started out as a point. It then started growing rapidly and then slowed down for a couple billion years. Moving up toward the middle, it says accelerating expansion. Uh, in order for that to happen, they had to infer that dark energy existed. So you have these two mystery elements, dark energy and dark matter. Uh, the graph at the right shows that the universe that we know and love is composed of 5% ordinary matter matter you can touch, feel, smell, and to anything, write books about 5% of everything there is. 27% is dark matter and 68% dark energy. So most of the universe is something we can't put in a jar and look at. We can't touch. We can't really understand what it is. And that's still an open, open question right now. But only 5% is something we, we can deal with. 21st century came along. Astrobiology, the biology of life beyond Earth, is what NASA is doing currently. That seeks to understand an alien life wherever it might exist. The picture of, on the, the left shows Mars, and it's got some ice 
peering through. This is, I think, a, a North Polar cap on Mars. It may have supported life in the past. The atmosphere and surface, however, are intensely dry. There's hardly any free water on the surface. Liquid water probably is underground there, but it hasn't really been it, uh, seen in any great uh, pools lying anywhere on the surface. The center picture has Europa, which is Jupiter's moon, and Enceladus on the right, which is Saturn's moon. Both of these contain more warm water than all the oceans on the Earth. That's water that might include aquatic life. And the geysers that you see coming out of the bottom on, on Enceladus, those are real. Those three, they were in the first picture that we got from Enceladus and from, from all uh, further future ones. Uh, they're actually spewing water out into space. One of the probes that I think NASA would like to do would be to send a probe through those geysers and try to pick up some of the water to see if there's any microscopic life that's connected with it. Now these moons are a relatively circular orbit around their planets, but there are competing moons nearby which pull them off course a little bit. There's tidal stretching which happens, and that stretching on the, the actual moons causes the, the, the moons to heat up. The water is hot, not because of sunlight, but because of this constant stretching that's going on. And you can see on the picture of, of Enceladus, they've cut away a section how much is water, the green on the inside, versus the thickness of rock and, and uh, ice above it. So these two might be candidates for life. Unfortunately, there's no way they're going to use radio to transmit to us because you just can't do much with water uh, flooding your transmitter. Here's the Mars gallery. Martian meteorite landed in Antarctica in 1984. The picture on the left shows a small worm-like structure. I'm going to ask, was it alive? What NASA actually asked about it. This is from the Allen Hills 1984 meteorite. It was sitting on the ground in Antarctica. That's one of the best places on Earth to look for meteorites because any rock that you see there came from outer space and they were able to almost identify the place on Mars where it came from. This is an electron microscopy, microscopy picture, and it's really magnified thousands of times, and that worm-like structure might have been a petrified animal. It's hard to say. Since that point, a number of rovers have been put on Mars. The Curiosity rover, when it was passing the Murray Butte, which is that center picture there, uh, in 2016, picture was taken of it. The top shows some, uh, like the area was sheared apart and you have a lot of rocks falling down. I took my iPhone and enlarged the picture and put it on the right side. And I'm, I'm going to ask you, take a look at that picture. Does anything look funny to you, non-random? Do you see anything that, that looks a little weird? I'll give you a moment because I want to bring down my annotation key that the grandkids showed me how to use. Here we go. This is the first thing that to me looks a little bit funny. Second one is over here. Third one over this way. Oh God. And then we've got what looks like eyes and, and e nose and, and teeth over here. This one looks a little bit like an alligator. What I see, and I, I'm cautioning you, these are probably not valid conclusions. This one looks like an animal with eyes, ears, and a mouth, and it's sitting on a pedestal, and the pedestal actually looks like it has rectangular uh, corners on both sides. This one looks a little bit like a, a porpoise. This is the brother of this one over here. Uh, this one to me looks like a, an interesting face from, from Easter Island, and this has that sort of alligator shape. None of these, I'm sure, are real. And I think if it were possible to have a close-up, a really good close-up, so that you could see, these would probably just be rock rock formations that are close together, but they look awfully suspicious. So I'll leave that for your, your own imagination.
and uh, it looks tantalizing. Okay, let's see if we can do this. This one is an incredible, incredible uh, slide. And I want you to kind of focus on it. If you notice, I'm going to ask what color grass is near a red dwarf star. The red dwarf star we're talking about is Proxima Centauri. It's four light years from Earth. It's relatively, it's the closest star near the sun. Our sun, of course, is eight and a half light minutes away. So that's, uh, it's just so close compared to, to Proxima. Our sun is yellow. It's yellow to our eyes. Proxima would be red to our eyes. But the peak colors depend very much on what the temperature is of the surface of each star. So if you take a look over here, our sun has the surface temperature about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. This shows the, em the emission at each frequency of our sun. And notice our eyes are sensitive to red, deep red going all the way up through green, yellow, down to violet. And then we get into a region where we're blind. We can't see anything here. This is, this is our ultraviolet area. This is our infrared area. We're blind over here too. We can only see between red and purple. But notice our eyes are really adapted very well to this, the energy output from the sun. That's fascinating. Uh, what about earthly leaves and grass? They're green. We all know they're green. They're green because of chlorophyll pigment. But in the fall, the chlorophyll dies. So here you can see just a little bit of chlorophyll left on the leaf and secondary pigments, which are, are also there, but they're not as strong as chlorophyll. They don't produce as much food for the leaf, are red and orange. Well, and earthly animal eyes align with the peak colors of our sun. How come? The best I can make out is it improves our survival chances against predators and it helps us find food. Most animals on earth are sensitive to this light range, most but not all. Uh, take a look now at Proxima Centauri. It has an earth, it has two uh, exoplanets. One I just saw today, it was discovered in January, but the one that, that uh, this is produced for is um, closer to, to, it's in the actual uh, Goldilocks zone and liquid water could exist on its surface. But look what's going on here. The peak colors coming out of, the, of Proxima at 3000 degrees, it's half the temperature of our sun, 3000 degrees, the peak color is in the infrared area. We're blind to that. We can't see that color. We can't see anything over here until it hits the red area for us. So proximate to us would look like it's red. And yeah, we could see, we certainly can see all the way through purple, but the amount of purple light's almost nothing there. Uh, mostly it's going to be red, maybe a little yellow or orange, hardly any green and, and forget the rest of it. So Proxima was not made for our eyes. Um, let's take a look at that now. If there were animals on Proxima Centauri's exoplanet, my feeling is, and a couple of other researchers too, they should probably be eyes that are sensitive to this area in here. Maybe they sneak a little bit into the red. I would doubt very much that they reach yellow or green. This is the area. They're great in infrared. Any animals and any intelligent animals that we want to talk to should be blind in ultraviolet all the way through about green. If I wore a green shirt talking to an uh, intelligent animal on one of those planets, it would appear black to them because they can't see uh, blue, they can't see violet, they have a lot of trouble with green, I think. So this is what just knowing the physics of the situation, it says you've got a cooler star, you're going to have animals that are, are sensitive over here. Conversely, and I haven't done it, if you had a hotter star than the sun, they're going to be uh, excellent in ultraviolet. And we're going to, but that's another story. SETI, the SETI Institute, this is the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, 
SETI was set up in 1984 to explore for life in the universe using radio telescopes and visible light. They were looking for signs of laser communication. It's out in Hat, Hat Creek, California, Northern California area. They have this whole series of radio dishes and every day, every night, they don't, it doesn't matter. They can do their work in the daytime as well as night. Uh, they're looking for any kind of signal. Now, what kind of signal have we been emitting since 1920, radio and TV broadcasts from Earth have been expanding. They go right through our ionosphere and they're creating an expanding sphere of broadcast waves. We're putting the evening news on, we're putting our comedy shows and everything else, uh, and that's all going out into space. That broadcast sphere is now 100 light years in radius. We're announcing our presence to anybody anything within a hundred light years. To date, however, no evidence of any alien signals, beacons, or intelligence has ever been observed. That's painful. Uh, how come nobody's taken up our, our call? Nobody's answering and responding to any of our signals. Uh, there must be within a hundred light years of Earth, somebody who's receiving that. If we were sitting on, on that planet, that exoplanet, around Proxima, do you know what would happen? We set our tent up. If we had our antenna going, we could hear broadcast from Earth. It's four light years away. It's strong enough signal, not a problem. And you know what? We would hear the news from four years ago because that's how long it takes light to get there. Um, but we have no responses yet. That's, that's a shame. Now we're gonna go farther out into space. Andromeda Galaxy, M31. It's 3 million light years away, and it's approaching the Milky Way. In fact, it's going to collide with us 4 billion years from now. When that happens, it's not going to be a good day for Earth. Both galaxies are going to intermingle. Their black holes are going to merge, and we're going to have to rename it Milky Andromeda. It's going to splatter like the colliding galaxies shown here at the right. These are two spiral galaxies. You can see matter flowing on a bridge between one to the other. Whoops, come back. Ah. All right, what are you doing to me? Come back. There. Uh, you've got so much matter that's spewing out, and we could be lucky and get hurled into space. Probably we won't have the sun with us because there's no reason that, that it have a stable orbit anymore. Uh, it's going to be an interesting time four billion years from now, but that's nothing we have to worry about. It's possible, and these are all images of Andromeda in different electromagnetic uh, frequency ranges. So take a look over here at the top two. These are both invisible light. You can actually see Andromeda. If you were in a dark sky, you could look up in the fall and you could see Andromeda glowing up there. You would see not this whole range out here, you see the white area right near, near where the black hole is. Uh, and, and what's happening is visual light can't penetrate the dust that's there. But take a look in X-ray over here. The X-ray satellite, Rosette, is actually able to visualize more of the, the black uh, hole. And then you have little spots here which are supernovae that are going off. Uh, X-ray penetrates dust and it has, just like it does, X-ray can penetrate uh, skin and bone to show you inside the human body. Well, the satellite, the Rosat satellite, can actually show you what's inside of much of, of the Andromeda. But take a look down here. These are infrared, all three infrared images, and this one is in radio frequency. Look at the ring that's around here. This is a ring where a uh, tremendous amount of dust is compressing, compacting into new stars. The new stars are being formed here. And that's sort of like a bandsaw. When that thing comes toward the Milky Way, that's going to cut us in half. That's, that's something we might want to watch out for at some point in the future. All right, now this took place just about a year and a month ago. Uh, the first image of a real black hole. This is 53 million light years away. It's in the constellation Virgo. And you notice over here, this, this, this is the accretion ring. Before matter flows into a, a black hole, it goes into a ring, and this is showing the yellowish area. This is facing Earth, 
and the darker area is actually matter behind the, the, uh, uh, the, the black hole, and the black hole is here in the center. This is a fascinating picture to see, and it vindicates what, uh, validates what I, Einstein had uh, discovered. Last piece I want to show you is the gravitational wave observatories. This is, is the LIGO observatories, this put out by Caltech, have detected gravity waves, which are predicted by Einstein's general theory. These waves have nothing in common with radio, microwave, or light. Absolutely not connected with them. Illustrated here are two black holes that are circulating around each other. Um, as they circulate, we're getting all kinds of, of radiation coming out, which are the gravitational waves. Now, the fascinating part of this is, is this chart over here. The last few seconds, well, this is actually a tenth of a second for between here and here, tenth of a second, another tenth. This represents maybe a half a, half a second in the life of two black holes that are going to collide. And this took place 1.2 billion years ago. It's fascinating how far in the past, and you're, you're only worried about a half a second in that life. But here's what happened. As they started swirling close to each other, the peak gets higher, higher, higher. Finally, the last orbit, before they actually touch, suddenly here they begin to merge. You're not, it's not getting higher anymore. And those two peaks in the merger show you what's happening in a really short time. And look, the ring down, this is like taking a hammer and socking a bell. And the bell starts to, to actually get softer and softer after a while. It took such a short time for the, the, the two black holes to merge. And once they merge, they don't, em they don't emit uh, gravity waves anymore. So in this space, what happened before the merger, the first black hole was 29 solar masses. It's 29 times as big as our sun. It collided with a 36 solar mass black hole, which adds up to 65. After the merger, it was a 62 solar mass black hole and three solar masses radiated away as gravity waves for us to consider here on Earth. And it, it, that, in that space of time, that, that was all thrown out it twisted space, it, it made space go in and out. We measured it at LIGO, and that was the first time that we ever did that. Since that point, this table just shows through 2017, but a whole bunch more have been discovered since, and it's fascinating that this is the future of, of astronomy right now. There are some miscellaneous pieces that I wanted to share with you. 1800 years ago, Tractate Avodah Zarah, in the Talmud asked, during the 12 hours of the night, what does God do? The Gemara answers, somebody had asked, what does God do during a typical day? So they want to know what does God do at night? If you wish, you can say that the night is similar to the day. That is, God performs the same activities as in the daytime. Or if you wish, you could say he rides on his light cherub and flies to 18,000 worlds. This is part of, uh, of the Talmud. To date, we've actually seen 4,260 of those 18,000 exoplanets, none of which, unfortunately, or maybe it's fortunately, have any sign of life. In the 1500s, we talked a little bit about it before, round Earth and a sun-centered solar system was heresy. The Inquisition went after Copernicus and Galileo. But it's interesting to note that at this point in time, the church has changed and Jesuits now operate a modern observatory at Mount Graham in Arizona, and they perform some high quality astrophysical research. Times change. There are still some, some groups who, who cling to long cherished beliefs. And if you check this website, the Flat Earth Society would be very happy to, to greet you. There are some additional Jewish groups that, that hold those similar beliefs, but we're not gonna cover that today. To finish up, there's some interesting reads that you might find. The first book by Michael Summers and James Treffel, Exoplanets, it's a factual book. It's, uh, these are two uh, professors in Virginia, and they're reporting on potential life elsewhere. 
Unfortunately, there are no real aliens they can use it as, as examples, but it's good science, worth, worth reading. The three-body problem here in the middle, it's Chinese science fiction about very unhappy aliens from Proxima. And I'm asking the question, are we on their menu? You'll have to read to find out. The last one is intergalactic Judaism. This has some decent astrophysics. It's got sun-centered and round earth, but it's a very strong dose of orthodoxy. And I think you can take just a look at the cover and it shows the astronauts picture that they took when they were coming around the moon and they saw the earth rise. Definitely this, this book advocates around earth. There's no question of earth being flat or earth being supported by pillars of any sort. Uh, he's got his eyes open, the, or, the Rabbi David Lister. It might be an interesting book for you to check out. All right, uh, that's, that's my presentation. What I'm going to try to do, I know there's some questions that have popped up. Um, is there anyone who'd like to ask? And, and uh, how do you want to work it? Check the chat, Marty. All right, let me so get that. Put yourself out of here. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, I'm sitting here. So uh, the question I have is, uh, with those two black holes coming together, you've got uh, the mass of three suns. Uh, Henry, all... I can understand matter and energy. Uh, Henry, but gravity and energy and matter. Uh, Wait, can, can, I, can I just have only one person talk? Please mute, mute everybody else. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Yes. Uh, uh, the point you had with the, the two black holes merging, they yes. have 60, 60, was it 69 suns? 62. Mass or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Up with three less suns becoming gravity. So, I can understand energy matter, you know, equals mc squared equivalency, but that's not in the, in, in the equation for gravity. So is energy gravity or is mass gravity? I mean, what happened there? The nature, what happened was as these two black holes merged and apparently once they touch, it goes pretty rapidly and they start vibrating, but that vibration settles down quickly. As we saw, the ring down was really, really rapid. Uh, the fact that they had been sweeping around each other was converted into pulling space-time. Black holes can actually cause space-time to twist around. And as you get close to it, the twisting motion is what's causing space-time to move back and forth. Now that's 1.2 billion light years away. By the time it reaches us on Earth, uh, it's really microscopic. It's almost half the diameter of an atom that, that they were trying to measure using the LIGO observatory. It took them years to try to actually uh, tickle that information out from the, the data and the noise. But it, it, space time, because of that event, which was out there, it pulled us a little bit back and forth. And that's what they were able to measure in Hanford, Washington and, and uh, down in Louisiana, where they have the, the several observatories that are actually working this. It's a conversion of some of the mass into energy, the vibrational energy, and the vibrational energy is what, what caused us to move back and forth. We couldn't, ourselves, we didn't feel it. I think if a black hole were, let's say, a couple of light years away, and it went off like this, we would feel ourselves vibrating back and forth. There's no question about it. But this thing was 1.2 billion light years away. That's microscopic at this point. But it is. it was converting some of its energy into the gravitational wave. That's what happened. Would this be the, the uh, uh, unified field theory where you bring gravity in as well as energy and matter? Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm not qualified in relativity theory to give you the answer fully, but I think if you look up on Google, you probably could, could get the answer to most questions related to that, even without the mathematics involved. I think to appreciate it fully, you probably need the math, but Google can probably give you in a paragraph or a couple of sentences what's happening, how that conversion takes place. Yeah. Anybody else? Just tell, tell me the question that you have. Don Sable says he's a Virgo. Wonderful. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. The Murray Butte uh, 
debris has rectangular features from an ocean layering, no scale given. Uh, yeah, I, I did the best I could with, with my uh, iPhone. I'm not sure I could do any better. Uh, with a 100 light year broadcast sphere, we'll be receiving messages in 50 years. It's possible. We're announcing, yeah, we are announcing our presence, whether for good or for bad, uh, our presence is being announced by all of the TV and radio broadcasting and radar that, that's being put out. We're announcing ourselves to the universe. I hope that that's for good, but um, we, may, we may be tripping ourselves up. And that's what that Chinese science fiction book was dealing with. Anybody else have a question here? Yeah, uh, what was the environment around Einstein that uh, made him so, so creative? And were there other people that were contributing to his creativity to the environment? Uh, he had a couple of mentors and, uh, and then, but, but he didn't have a university position. He was able to get a job in, in the patent office in uh, Switzerland, but that gave him some time on the side to be able to figure this out. But I think basically it was his own genius that put pieces together and said, you know what, if I get in an elevator and somebody cuts the wire and I start falling, would I feel gravity or not? And he, he answered no. So it must be that gravity is the same thing as an acceleration. And, and so he took one thing led to another and he used what were called thought experiments to try to say, what was it like traveling with a light wave? Well, if I'm traveling with a light wave, does time exist? The answer was no. I mean, he came out with all this in order to make his theory work, he had to make the speed of light a constant. If you make speed of light constant, distance equals rate times time, suddenly you had to be able to compress uh, spatial dimensions. So if you're traveling at three quarters of the speed of light, the direction you're traveling in, your spaceship gets smaller. And, and it's, it's a really weird concept to play with. It's not as weird as quantum theory. And the problem physics has had ever since is how do you rectify, how do you put relativity and quantum theory together? One is the theory of the small, the other the theory of the big. The only time they were ever together was at creation. Bereshit, it was the instant of creation. And there you need quantum gravity in order to, to solve that. That's the next major step that physics is gonna to have to solve. Uh, there's no theory about that right now. Uh, I think the possibilities are that maybe you need to go to 11 dimensions and you need to, to go through all the string theory business. That's a, a subject for another time. Marty. <laughs> Yeah, Marty, it's me, Don. With Go. all the emissions from yeah. Earth and by humans Sorry, that yeah. some people think are contributing to global warming, even your, you Shabbat, your Shabbat messages, yes. <laughs> when you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's my Shabbat humor. When you look with a telescope yeah. and looking up into the heavens, can you see evidence of that? Can you see changes in the atmosphere? Can you see pollution? Has it changed you, what you view the last 10 or 20 years compared to 30 or 40 years ago? Oh, you're talking about the environment around the earth? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure. And I heard that even during the pandemic, where we haven't been using our cars that much, things have changed. Animals are coming out. The sky, if you take a look, is a little clearer now than it was three months ago. Yeah, you can, you can definitely see changes that way. Anybody else? Go for it. You're muted. Can't hear you. Can you tell us more about wormholes? Uh, yeah, wormhole, basically, if you take a piece of paper, you take a piece of paper and fold it over and then take a pencil or pen and stick it right through and make a hole through both pieces, you will have created a wormhole. That's in the, the simplest way. And then if you were an ant walking along the page and you fell in the hole and started walking on the bottom, that's, that's the essence, that's the essential lesson that comes from a wormhole. That's what it is. The question is, uh, and they explored it in the book Contact that Carl Sagan wrote. That's an excellent book to read also. Uh, if you fell through the black hole, through, through the wormhole um, and you came out on the other side, you would not have walked around the entire paper. You would have gone straight to your destination. And who knows what the time would have been. 
what time it is in each place. So uh, that's the theory behind it. The math gets extremely involved. And I think what they found is you need to be able to keep the wormhole open so that you can actually fall through it. You need some way to do that. We don't have the technology to do it yet, but I think that's something to look forward to in the next several years, if not the, the next century. Yeah. Anybody else? Selma. Can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted, Selma. I had attended a session with you on a, at a Tikkun Lail shovel oat where you spoke and a representative from the Franklin Institute spoke. Yes. And they definitely talked about all the different other uh, planets and asteroids and millions of things that are out there in space. And at the end of this talk, they said something very important. They said, it, it, there's a certain human hubris to think that considering everything that's out there, that we are the only intelligent people able to exist in that greater universe that we rarely even think about. And Mike, it's always bothered me because I wonder, and this is an open question to everybody on the call, we haven't received ever any communication that there is intelligence out there. And is there any efforts made? I know we make efforts to reach them, but I'm wondering if um, what would our world be if we ever discovered um, other life or how that might impact our world? Uh, it's, it's an a open great question. question. It's a great question. Yeah, I think what, what the impact might be is going to be incredible. Uh, it depends what, what actually the, the life looks like. Most likely, we're going to just, well, we, we're, we're dealing with a pandemic right now with a virus. It's possible that there are viruses on some of the asteroids, some of the uh, meteorites that land on Earth. They could be bringing disease with them. It's possible. We're dealing with something right now, which who knows where it came from. Um, it, it's possible that there is an intelligent life that's not at our same level yet. So they don't have the ability to broadcast any electromagnetic signal. They can't answer us with radio, TV, or anything else, because let's say they were uh, as we were in the 1700s. There was no radio then, but there were intelligent people around. It took getting to a certain technological level to be able to answer with radio. Now, suppose it goes the other way. Suppose we're still using radio, TV, and all this good stuff, We've just discovered that the internet works great if you have a cable under the ocean and you don't even have to use a uh, radio broadcast. Maybe that's obsolete. Maybe if you want to go 100 light years away, you don't want to sit, get in a rocket ship and go uh, 50,000 years to get there. You may want to puncture space, space time and go there using a wormhole. And maybe that's where and how other intelligent species go. Uh, so we are either too early or too late with radio broadcasting. Maybe that's an answer. I'm not, I'm not saying that's the way it has to be, but it's, it's a good possibility. Good question, though. Martin, my uh, name is Alan. I'm from Boston. And my question, getting back to the wormhole, is how does one fold space to bring those two points together? <laughs> You want me to answer? <laughs> Oi. <laughs> if I knew that, I'd get the Nobel Prize too. Um, Carl Sagan in his book, Contact, wrote to a few of, of his physicist friends, and they said, you have to go out and get rare earth elements. You have to put them together in technologies that we don't have. And then suddenly you'll just fall through uh, space time, not space, but space time, and you'll wind up somewhere else. I don't have a clue how you might do that. And even though I watch Star Trek night after night and they go through it and there's not a problem, it is a problem if you're actually trying to do it. So I don't know. That's a great question. 
Uh, that's probably mid to late 21st century, possibly 22nd century physics. It's not here now, and I wish I had it. I really do. I have a Harold Weinstein sent something, wants to know if the universe is expanding, how do black holes converge? Uh, black holes still have gravity, Harold. They attract each other. If one came, came near the sun, it would rip up the orbits of our planets. We'd have a real, real problem. And it conceivably, if it came close to the earth, could fall through the earth and just fold everything into it. Uh, that's, that's, uh, they have gravity and they can therefore attract each other. Good question. Anybody else have questions? If you do, uh, unmute yourself and call out. Hi, Martin. Yes. Hi, it's Bob Watts. Hi, Bob. Um, I have a, actually uh, somebody I worked with, her husband was at Ames uh, working on the um, exoplanet uh, work there at, at NASA Ames. Beautiful. But, so I was interested in this for a few years. Now, have we actually seen any exoplanets or is it all inferred from the effect of the planets on the, on the stars and other bodies? Uh, yes, we have seen a couple. Uh, you can actually see it if there's a disk of material around a star and the planet is actually clearing out an area. So you can see a ring and you see the little dot of the planet. There's a whole new set of uh, satellites that are going up now. I think uh, one of them has a coronagraph in it, which is to yeah. null out the light of the star so that the planetary lights around it will, will be bright enough to be seen. And yes, uh, there's going to be a whole bunch more of those coming through. But I think if you look in Sky and Telescope magazine or on mm -hmm. Google and just say planets, uh, exoplanets that have been visible, they'll show you some pictures of it. Yes, that's great. True. This guy is working on the Coronagraph project at, uh, at Ames. Uh, that's beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting. I mean, Alpha um, or uh, Proxima Centauri, that's like uh, part of a trinary system, right? Of, yes, uh, yes. When we were down in, in Australia, one of the first things, I went to a restaurant one night, walking down the street, I said, where is it? I looked up and Alpha Centauri popped out, the whole uh, Southern Cross thing. And I said, oh, we've arrived. It's just felt so good. It's like going to another planet to see the Southern part of the Milky Way, which mm. you can't see from, from North America. It's just oh. a, a fascinating feeling. But yeah, um, Alpha Centauri, I think is a double star and, and Proxima is going around. So it's like a triple. And uh, they're about four light years away. Proxima is right now a little closer and apparently, most stars in the sky are red dwarfs. This is something that's been recently uh, understood. The red dwarf is just smaller than the sun. It's going to last three or four times longer than our sun, because the smaller the mass, the longer it lasts. And apparently, more animals are going to be having that eye issue that I talked about, where their eyes are sensitive to infrared compared to what ours are. Uh, that's, that's not just a uh, one time off and that's it. Most stars are, are red dwarfs right now that we've been able to find out. So yeah, it's close, Thanks. it's close. And, and somebody, I think one of the Russian oligarchs wanted to f fund a project where they were gonna take micro uh, size nan nanoparticles, put sails on them and hit them with laser beams and send them in the direction of, of Proxima Centauri with transmitters on to be able to transmit information back. They could accelerate it almost to the speed of light, so it would take four years to get there. And that would be a fascinating thing. They, they were actually trying to price out the, the project. It, it's, it's feasible. Wow. Anybody Thank else? You. I can't see any more, but if you got it. Uh, Marty, just check the chat. Yeah, I've got that. Okay, I think we've covered pretty much everybody. All right, it's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, have a, 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 a beautiful Shavuot. Marty, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. I didn't understand 90% of it, so I know that's why. <laughs> <Oy vey. laughs> and And uh, <laughs> but everybody else did, I'm sure. Rabbi Lehman, thank, thank you. For, <laughs> thank Go you ahead. for your input on, on uh, the Talmud part from this. <laughs> Have a good, a good evening, guys. For your assistance. Thank you for all for participating. Uh, a wonderful evening, folks. A happy 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure looking at all. Thank you, Marty. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great job, Marty.